Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Phil Jankowski, state reporter for the Dallas News. In today's show, we're talking about the Texas energy grid, including how lawmakers are trying to fix it, what to expect for this coming winter, and how Bitcoin miners fit into the grid. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. Today, I'm joined by Dallas News reporter, Phil. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thanks. Happy to be here. Great. So uh, to begin, we should honestly just get like a little rundown on yourself and then what you cover in the state of Texas. Of course, the for today's conversation, we're mostly going to be talking about ERCOT and what the plan is for energizing Texas going into the winter months as it's become a fairly contentious issue. Well, I'll boot it over to you just for an introduction on yourself, and then we'll dive into today's conversation. Yeah, I, I'm a, a state government reporter that reports on politics for the Dallas Morning News in Austin, Texas. Uh, so I report on uh, basically the uh, uh, goings on of our uh, state lawmakers. Uh, part of my focus, there's a team of us, uh, but part of my focus on that is uh, on uh, energy and the power grid. Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely been a question as of late. I mean, this go, all goes back to that February 2021 storm, uh, winter storm URI that took out a large portion of Texas infrastructure and then also led to the, uh, some some deaths. Uh, about 200 plus people died, unfortunately, from that winter storm. And that's caused a lot of questions about how Texas manages it's energy grid, and it seems that the conversation is ongoing. So I'm just going to kick the question over to you, maybe provide some context on what's happening recently uh, down in Texas, down in Austin, on what uh, needs to be amended to the Texas grid. Yeah, we're nearly two years removed now from uh, that winter, winter storm that really, uh, uh, for, for your viewers and listeners that don't remember, uh, came close to a, a near collapse of our power grid and left the you know more than half of the state in darkness uh in freezing temperatures uh for five days um the big reaction to that has been to um uh you know take a very comprehensive look at the uh texas power grid uh which is uh known as uh ERCOT the acronym is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, but easy enough to just either call it ERCOT or the Texas Power Grid. Um, what has been going on uh, recently is that uh, we have gotten to a point that uh, the, the first sort of actions that were taken was to weatherize, winterize um, uh, power plants and uh, and electricity production infrastructure uh, that has already occurred um and now the longer term look is at how they're going to address the fundamentals of of the actual power grid marketplace in texas Awesome. Yeah, it seems like the conversation is only stirring up more. And the first thing I actually thought about this when I've been seeing these reports on Twitter from yourself and other people I follow in the Texas grid is like, why has this not been solved yet? And you mentioned the storm was two years ago. There's been some work done on renterization, but it still seems like the key fundamentals of the problem, which is generation and transmission of energy to the correct sources is ongoing. And just as a layman, someone who's like ignorant about why or how this should be fixed, be curious to get your take on why is it taking two years? And is that acceptable amount of time for something like this to take to solve? Yeah. I mean, to, to uh, the folks that were freezing in their homes, uh, if you, if, if, of course that is unacceptable. Um, but there are realities that you have to deal with the, the speed of business. Um, you can't just even even a, 
uh, uh, the way you know this is the, the way things are set up in this in this country with a, with a capitalist uh, you know economy. Uh, it's it's up to businesses to sort of you know create these large investments that are going to increase the amount of generation um, and uh, address. Uh, that aspect of it, uh, transmission is more uh, in Texas, at least, is more government guided uh, there. But that has been less of a focus. Um, so uh, it it is a time uh, it is a very time consuming process, and and honestly, it still feels like it's several years away before the the market rules. Um, change to whatever the next uh, iteration of the Texas power market is. Um, we've been talking about as 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 they've gotten kind of closer to adopting rules. They've been talking about implementation times that could take three or four years. Sheesh! Okay, so that raised my eyebrows there because that years away is not acceptable for someone like you said who's you know freezing in their house every winter and it's definitely needed for what Texas is growing year over year in population terms. So it seems to only be a mounting problem just to set the chest table for us a little bit here. Who's the players that we should know about from like the Texas government, from ERCOT, from like the generation side, like who are we mostly talking about when we're talking about people coming to the table and figuring out this problem? Yeah. Um, I mean, you either Texas is an oil and gas uh, state. So I feel like the, uh, that's the first sort of players or sectors that you that you have to uh, mention there. Um, you know, the power grid is uh, a large portion of the uh, generation comes from natural gas. Texas is a major natural gas producing state, and and a ton of uh, business businesses and tax revenue comes from oil and gas and ga- and natural gas and, and, and Texas has been uh, since the uh, a real modernization and, and, and the fracking miracle as they as they call it um, uh, Texas has really um, been ascendant in that um, so they're you know they're at, that's an extremely powerful lobby um, uh, so there are the Natural gas producers, you know, second at the table are going to be the industry groups representing the uh, power producers. So your power plant companies, you've got several large companies in Texas that own more generation than than others. And then um, the uh, and then the sort of, you know, starting from where the fuel comes from to where the electricity is produced. And then you get to the final end of it. Uh, all um, is the uh, the actual power providers. So that's um, your your municipal government owned utilities, your rural electricity cooperatives, and then the large portion of Texas that is part of the um, uh, very uh, deregulated uh, market that allows people to choose their power provider. So a, a ton of uh, private companies that are power providers. Those are the big, that's the business side of it. On the government side of it, you've got obviously the leadership in, uh, you know, you've got the governor, um, you've, and then you've got the state lawmakers. um, uh, But then you've also got uh, agencies like the Public Utility Commission, which has really taken the lead in in this whole market redesign and weatherization process, that is uh, uh, just a, a a board of appointed folks. Um, and then uh, beyond that, you've got the Texas Railroad Commission, which has nothing to do with railroads. Uh, that is actually a, a a body that regulates the oil and gas industry. So that's actually an elected board of of uh, um, of folks that regulate the oil and gas industry. And then finally, you've got um, ERCOT, the uh, the agency that runs the Texas Power Grid. 
but they 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 you could kind of lump them in with the public utility commission because they kind of report directly to that to them. So it's a lot. Of, it's a lot of folks, as I said. It's a that, lot that, of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a What's lot of the hierarchy people. here. Like the how does that work? Okay, yeah. The hierarchy. I mean, the governor. The, the governor has the most uh, has the most control over the governor appointed the people that run the public utility commission. So he has the most sort of, he, he, it kind of, it feels like he has the most direct control over it, but though he, though it is debatable and his office will, would say that he's not as, it is as involved in the day-to-day aspects of it. But um, that's, as I said, debatable. Um, and then on the, the, uh, uh, lawmaker side of it, the folks crafting the policy, um, uh, you've you've got the uh, you know the leadership of the uh, Texas legislator there. So that's the head of the Texas Senate, the the head of the the uh, Texas House of Representatives. They're going to have you know an outsized uh, voice in in this. Um, the Railroad Commission. Uh, as I said, those are unlike the Public Utility Commission. Those folks are elected officials, so they are beholden unto only the voters. Um, and uh, and being uh, and so, it's an extremely powerful board that regulates or doesn't regulate, as a lot of folks would would argue, the oil and gas industry. They have been accused of being a. Uh, Cap, uh, captured agency that is beholden to uh, oil and gas, um, and then uh, so that's the higher uh, that's the the political hierarchy there. I would say the most important um, folks right now are the folks at the Texas legislature, uh, just because the they are about to just because of where we find ourselves at this at this point in time. Um, which I can explain that if you want to, but I, I'm afraid we're in the weeds here a little bit. No, I think it's important to go into it in terms of energy market because most people, when they think about Texas energy grid, if they know anything about it at all, I mean, might not be curious about it at, at all. Uh, most people are not curious about energy, but um, you know, here we are talking about it. They think it's like decentralized, or at least it's like it's unregulated, it's open, anyone can plug in. Uh, it's a free market, but. Oftentimes when I see articles about it, I see how politicized it actually is. There's so many players involved. There's a lot of regulators. The governor has a hand in these things. And then even like the generation sources and the power providers, like, you know, there's monopolies within these things naturally, which are often politicized. They might not be politicized in terms of like voters voting for things, but they're politicized in the sense that it's a monopoly with power and they get to decide what they want to do with their uh, corporate power. So Give me like a little sense of like how that power distribution works. Uh, I think listeners would also appreciate it because to an outsider, it's a little confusing. Yeah, it's it's very dense uh, stuff. It's taken me, you know, two two years to really kind of unravel and feel like that I that I have a good enough uh, um, understanding of it to even you know come on a on a program like this. But uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially, uh, you were asking about the the hierarchy of it more more or less. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a decentralized market. It is, a, it is at, at, at its current state, it is a, a very unregulated market. There has been some new uh, levers that, that have been placed in the hands of uh, the grid operator, ERCOT, that have really kind of given them some power that when you learned that they didn't have seem almost kind of silly. I'm talking about the fact that like power generators, um, power plants didn't have to give, get any approval from the grid operator to just shut down for maintenance for extended periods of time. So, and you know, that was something that is now like in ERCOT's power that, that, you know, that, that they could, that they could do that. You know, they didn't used to, there, there used to be, um, you you know, there, there used to be basically like you fill out a form and then you just do it. And now, you know, ERCOT can say during really like the hot summer months, uh, that like, no, you can't shut down. Like you, you, we need your electricity. Um, so, uh, it, it still is and remains very much an unregulated market. And we're entering in like, this is kind of for, for, um, uh, 
the politicians the, in 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 uh, Texas, you know, it's it's a state that has been um, uh, had twenty years of Republican rule in the in the governor's mansion and both chambers of the Texas legislature, not to mention the courts. Um, uh, and uh, and so it's really kind of a, an interesting tension here to see um, these folks who are very much their their political ethos is, is against government intervention and regulation to kind of have to walk that back and say, well, we actually do. But this has exposed the fact that we that there weren't enough controls on the system. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, so it is still a very decentralized system that is that was made that was you know by design um 20 20 or so years ago uh when they created the so-called energy only um market that really put a premium on competition and the lowest possible prices um and so like that that still remains there's been costs added and more power given to the grid operator ERCOT to kind of force generators to stay online. But as far as like new investment and hooking up to the grid, it's still com- comparatively uh, still a pretty wide open, uh, a, a wide open space here. Thanks for laying that out. Let's turn over to the, the argument, which is going on right now down in Austin. That's from my understanding with the public utility commission outlining some new ideas for how this Texas grid is going to change from my understanding, the winter storm back in February, 2021 incentivized the grid to change because it it was not working. Right. you mentioned that there was people turning off when they should be on there's transmission failures, winterization failures, half the state plunged into darkness. And now they're trying to come up with a new market model in order to incentivize people to stay online. Uh, If you could, Give us like a little context and background of what sort of models are working for and what the PUC is actually trying to accomplish here. What the what the PUC and really what the what the state leadership politically is trying to accomplish is is to um, you know on on their face create a more resilient um, power grid. The priorities that that they have adopted and seem to be pursuing. Uh, excuse me, uh, seem to be uh, are pursuing uh, is the uh, is to incentivize the uh, construction and addition of new power plants that are fueled by natural gas. Um, they call it um, they call it uh, they kind of use the term dispatchable um, and natural gas almost interchangeably. Dispatchable is a more broad term that refers to basically any electricity um, source that can be flicked on uh, at the flip of a switch. Um, So what is left out of that is um, so you've got dispatchable, um, which is, you know, you can turn on and off a natural gas power plant with certain amounts of ramp time. What you what what is left out of that, the big slice of Texas power production that's left out of that is uh, um, uh, wind and solar renewable renewable energy really wind wind and solar being the uh, top two there because they are uh, broadly referred to as intermittent energy uh, the, the wind uh, turbines only turn when the wind is blowing the solar arrays only you know only are generating electricity when the sun is shining um, uh, so, um, uh, the main, so the main, uh, thrust is to incentivize the construction of natural gas power plants. Um, the thought being that we want to have this stuff on the grid in case if we get to a situation, um, uh, where it are, where the power production is, is plummeting in, in a, um, in a, in a weather uh, emergency such as uh, the, the 2021 winter storm, or really what is more, uh, or like a, a big heat wave like we had um, this past summer. Um, so uh, the um, 
And, and so like, that's the real thrust of it. But there's, you know, I've got a, a piece that, I, that I'm working on that really kind of looks at, at that uh, because the, there's kind of an, a, 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 a desire to um, kind of go after renewable energy. It kind of is getting the blame uh, because it is not always generating and it's, uh, it's kind of been almost from the, um, from almost day one, it's been getting the blame for what happened, uh, during the winter storm, um, which they, which it did experience major outages. Um, but so did natural gas facilities and, and actually more. Uh, so it's a very interesting thing to see that the solution to the problem is, is, you know, in part more of the same problem, you know? So just to clarify, the PUC is looking at bringing additional natural gas operations onto the grid in order to backstop the grid in case of it, of excess heat or uh, excess cold. It's very complex, but, but um, how, what their, their proposal is, but more or less, they are forwarding a market a, a market design. Their favorite market design is one that basically um, provides uh, incentives. Um, they, it, set, it creates basically a whole new market that really um, only natural gas would be able to participate in. Um, they call it the, the performance uh, credit mechanism, which is just the worst name ever. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's, I mean, this is just such a jargon filled um, subject area, uh, uh, but essentially it's, it's the, the, the whole design is to um, give credits to um, natural gas producers that are producing during peak demand um, uh, and, uh, and then allowing them to, uh, well, basically a forcing um, power uh companies and and municipal utilities who you who you pay your electric bill to forcing those entities to buy those uh performance credits mm. so let's take a step back if i can for a second and then dive into that market structure when i think of like my local utility i always expect it to be on like i'm here in denver colorado and i have no knowledge of how i think it's excel energy is the provider out here i don't have a lot of knowledge about what's going on, except for I pay my monthly bill and I expect the lights to be on all the time. And I also have an expectation that the local government's going to enforce that according to law, that they're going to enforce that the lights be turned on if I'm paying for it. In Texas, I'm assuming you know contracts are contracts, so that still is going on. But it does seem like there's like this additional incentivization to keep the lights on during peak power, which you wouldn't have in other models. In other models, it seems like the utilities often public and they have to keep the lights on even when it's very expensive for them to generate the energy to do so. But in Texas, you have to have this additional incentive during hours of peak demand where it's very expensive to create energy. Is that more or less correct? Like just framing it that way? Not, 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 not exactly because like there is an obligation by the electricity providers here to keep the lights on. The question is, 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 is there just electricity there um, for them to be drawing for, for them to be drawing from? And so we've kind of, you know, the, 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 the sort of the incentive in Texas for, for power companies or, or for power plants to provide electricity to, um, you know, to, to, in order to keep the lights on, is just the basics, you know, the, the, the basic, we have to have the lights on or else, you know, you can't. You, your dialysis machines weren't working, or your 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 Samsung chip plant, you know, can't be producing things like that. So it's it's you know, um, uh, it's more just like we can't run, we can't run, we can't conduct the business of Texas if the if the if the lights aren't on. Okay, okay, that's good to understand. Let's dive into the market structure itself. So, I've done some reading, including some of your reporting on what is being considered in Texas right now. This seems to be a very decisive issue. A divisive issue, I should say, because the market structure is so uh, new. No one's ever done this before. I think even the mention from uh, some of the state legislators was like, this model has never been attempted anywhere in the world. And like you mentioned, it's some sort of credit system where 
uh, generators get credits and then power providers have to purchase those credits back and it somehow ensures this virtuous cycle of people keeping generation online and people being paid. Can you walk us through that again? And then I'm going to ask some follow-up questions about like why this model is even being considered when there are alternative models that seem to be more or less sustainable all across the United States. It, 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 you're, you're right. It kind of blindsided um, some of the uh, uh, legislators. And frankly, it surprised me. Um, the uh, Public Utility Commission is leading this effort, and they uh, basically uh, hired a, a firm to do, uh, to, to basically examine certain different kinds of market constructs that they have been talking about um, really ever since, um, you know, ever since and just like the, the, you know, a month removed from the 2021 storm, um, developing ideas and then hiring this firm to do like serious research into it. And then finally, after, you know, several months of research, that firm delivered this report and their recommendation. And the Public Utility Commission said, yeah, we hear you and we're not going with what you recommended. And in fact, we've come up with a completely new mechanism um, that just kind of popped up while we while you guys were doing your research. And that's what we're going to go forward with. Um, that being the uh, performance credit mechanism market. The company, it's it's uh, the 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 research company actually had um, had a market design that they had already recommended on behalf of doing work for a private a large private um, uh, uh, power uh, power company and and you know they they gave that to the public utility commission and said. This is what this company thinks. And we conducted the research on that and this white paper that says this is what we think is the best idea. Then they hired this firm. And lo and behold, that firm recommended the uh, nearly uh, uh, almost a carbon copy of what they had given to them more than a year ago. And the Public Utility Commission said that's not what, well, at least that's what the chairman of the Public Utility Commission, a man named Peter Lake, uh, is that that's that's not what we want. That what they had um, uh, put forward was something that is actually common in the United States: is a capacity market that basically pays power plants to be available um, in case of emergency. Uh, that does not jive well with the. Uh, they're they're trying to find some way to still have like this very uh, deregulated market while adding incentives. And so it just didn't, even though that's what I expected to come forth, the capacity market to, to them just, just feels like a politically unacceptable uh, market design. Yeah. Just from an outsider's perspective, maybe a comment here more than a question is seems like they're trying to rework the wheel when there's already ways of doing this. That might be an unfair thought. One thing I, I do want to bring up is just like the lawmakers that seem to have punted on this. So according to Dallas News reporting, it seems like legislators pushed back on the PUC's comment here to create this new market. And it seems to be, as you guys put it, in disarray at the moment. So where are we in the steps to creating this new Texas energy market, especially you know, winter's here? It's mid-December. Yeah. So the PUC comes out with this with this report and then and then it gets trotted out in front of uh, legislators who are are coming back to uh, uh, the Capitol in uh, in uh, in about a month. Um, And basically, they they as as you described, they said that this is untested and 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 then and were very highly critical of the fact that that, that they were forwarding an idea that they really couldn't find an an, an analog to or, or uh, you know something analogous to it or something you know a one to one or any any sort of you know proof that this is working elsewhere because it just seemed like a whole new idea um, out of left field so they were very critical and um, since then it's kind of come to uh, a bit of a, a bit of a halt. Um, the uh, the senators in a very influential committee basically sent a, a a signed by every single member said 
you need you, you need to stop what you're doing right now because what you're showing us doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and and frankly, we don't think it does what you say what you said it does. Um, the Public Utility Commission um, uh, pushed back and basically said, "No, this is this is this is works, and we're gonna we're gonna keep doing what we're doing." However, uh, then a few weeks a few weeks later, at another um, hearing, the uh, head of the Public Utility Commission basically said. We might approve this market design, but what we're approving now is not an actual change to the marketplace. It will just be a recommendation. And now you, um, uh, uh, and, and now you, a oh, wise um, lawmakers at the Capitol, can do with it what you will. Which is a real backtrack, uh, to be honest. They have been saying they have been at the public the public utility commission members have been asked multiple times and chairman peter lake has been asked multiple times whether he needed the the um uh, the state legislator to step in um and do anything else and he has said multiple times on the record no and now he's saying yes uh, uh do here's what we think here's what we're probably going to recommend and do whatever you want so it's all as as I said. I think like, I think I was quoting somebody as disarray, and it, and it really is because it feels like all we've done for this past uh, you know coming up you know like twenty months or so since this whole process began is basically we're just going to end up forwarding a, a research paper. We're talking thousands of hours of testimony, tens of thousands of hours of of, of work millions spent and then and then what's going to amount to it is you know we're going to let we're going to let the texas legislature figure it out which is frankly they're not experts yeah and then that adds even more time with with winter here before i ask the next logical question which is where are we going from here i do want to ask a little bit about uh generation and production of energy sources on the grid how do Texans, maybe just like your average taxpayer, maybe your legislator, think about generation on the Texas grid? Who do they ca- do they care about where it's coming from? If it's renewable or not? If it's natural gas or not? Do they really just want the lights to be on at this point? And how do they think about the demand side as well? Do they care who's really using this energy? Is there frustration that households might not be able to be warm this winter because there's like large takers on the grid, including Bitcoin mines. I think, um, I think more or less your average Texan uh, just wants the lights on. You just want to know that they're, you know, that they can rely on that because frankly, we've seen what happens when we, when we can't rely on that. And there's been, there's been echoes of that since then that they've been in the summer months, just this past year where we haven't had black blackouts or brownouts, but we've had, um, alerts sent from the, uh, you know, from, from ERCOT, the power grid folks saying, can you please, we need you to turn, it's, it's, it's way too hot. We need you to turn, we need to, we need you to turn up your thermostat. We need you to turn off your TV. We need you to conserve electricity because we're, we're there, we're hitting a point where we might, if, 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 you know, Something doesn't happen. We might have to do. We might have to cut power to somebody. Um, that happened, you know, three times. I might be wrong on on that, but I know for sure three times this year. Um, and and you know, some was in the summer. Some was in like the late spring, even when the temperatures were were kind of nice. You know, so there's still anxiety there. Um, uh, there's a bit of, you know, PTSD there to be, to be honest for a lot of folks, you know, I, I was one of them shivering in my house. Um, uh, so that's obviously what they care about most. I mean, there are people, you're more politically binded people definitely do care about where it comes from. Um, uh, you know, your, your youthful progressives, um, I'm in liberal Austin, so there's a lot of uh, folks that are very, uh, you know, um, you know, where, where we where we do have the local government makes pledges to buy power from renewable sources and stuff like that. But you know that those folks are easily outnumbered by 
folks that work in the industry. It's a huge industry. It's a huge driver of tax revenue as well. Oil and gas, I mean. So um, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of conflict there, and it is just like almost everything else, you know, kind of a a, a left and right um, sort of situation. Gotcha. What about demand from the grid? Uh, the follow up here, of course, is like we've seen Bitcoin miners move into that region. I think it's 1.7 gigawatts of uh, sustainable load or um, forget the industry term right now, but basically loads that can be turned off and diverted back to the grid. And I'm sure there's upwards of two gigawatts of Bitcoin mining on the grid at this point. And then there's other heavy infrastructure as well. Do is there, is there a sense from people you're reporting with or on about who's taking this load and are people frustrated with them? The fact that they're in line getting this load or What's the average sense from people you're speaking with? Yeah, I don't know. If frustration is 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 quite there. I mean, again, your average Texan just isn't really paying paying that much attention to that stuff. But the the you know they're, they're less enthusiastic about it than they are about you know a big you know you know like a a, a huge employer coming uh, to town. You know, like you know, I'm sure. We've got the Tesla, you know, plant here in Austin. That's a new thing that just is, it, that just came, you know, opened up this year, and and you know that brings with it a ton of jobs. So you've got a lot more, you know, you've got the governor out there trumpeting that kind of stuff. You've got press releases coming from, you know, Democrats and Republicans saying, "Look what we did to bring jobs, high-paying jobs," you know. But when it's a when it's that's not really there when it's a when it's a bank of computers out in like West Texas, um, you know that so. There isn't like I don't want I don't think that there are people necessarily opposed to it. You just don't see people cheering it on like you do when you see these these massive power, um, you know, these industrial. Uh, I wouldn't really call Bitcoin an industrial um, user. It's just it's just a, a user. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty there's small. Part, when you look at the job generation involved, but yeah. just not on the same order of magnitude as opening a factory, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we see that from the ERCOT reports, right? So I said about 1.7 gigawatts. And I think the total Texas grid, they had about 850 gigawatts of total generation with a margin there from the the latest report I saw. There is some enthusiasm. There's enthusiasm among some of the, some of the folks that are like, like, you know, folks that are paying attention like, like you, but all, but also like folks that are like, really kind of thinking about the uh, uh, a lot of the concepts of, of power demand and how having um, somebody like uh, or having a large amount of um, uh, mining Bitcoin mining uh, cryptocurrency mining operations in Texas because the you know the the, the positive aspect to that is the fact that like okay well you're going to be uh, you're creating more demand more demand incentivizes, more, you know, and more demand creates higher prices. Higher pro- higher prices creates a uh, an, an incentive for new power plants and and adding total generation. So they look at they they look at uh, um, so that's a good thing, especially the fact that um, there are these these big, a lot of these cryptocurrency mining operations are entering into contracts with their service provider that says. You know when 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 the prices are at a certain point, we will shut down. That creates the the, the sort of industry con- concept there that they've created is something called a virtual power plant, um, which is that like when there's an a, an, a, an incredible amount of demand, suddenly you you were saying that there might be two gigawatts of of uh, uh, you know demand coming from cryptocurrency miners. Well, the virtual power plant being that. We can add we can add in a quote unquote add two gigawatts of power generation for uh, hospitals, dialysis clinics, homes, schools by turning off um, cryptocurrency, and that power generation wouldn't be there if not for this this kind of um, you know this kind of demand that can be turned on and off. Um, it's kind of interesting that that like you've got the you know I, I haven't seen as much of, I'm it's only popping in my head right now the sort of the synergy between the uh, 
the dispatchable demand or like the dispatchable production and what we've got is like dispatchable demand as well. Um, I, I don't know that anybody's gone that, down that rabbit hole yet. We, we might be breaking new ground here. I don't know. You tell me. I feel like I'm going off. I feel like I'm going off the reservation here. <laughs> <laughs> the the flexible load stuff is something that you'll hear at any sort of Bitcoin meeting in Texas, always talking about, Hey, we can power off in an instant and divert this energy somewhere else. The difference here that a lot of people don't like to make though, or the point I should say, is that you have to be incentivized by money to do that. So they're not turning off their Bitcoin mines unless they're ethically feel the need to, or are incentivized to do it with money. From my understanding, there's no government poll to step in there. And that's very Texan from my understanding, right? It's like, almost very libertarian. You do what you want with your energy. Uh, but I do think that that separation there, the fact that you mostly are only turning off for money could lead to some negative PR for Bitcoin miners in the near future. And I was curious if you get that from anyone that you're speaking to. Um, no, not really, to to be honest. I mean, that's just... that to. Yeah, that's my opinion. That's just good business, you know. Um, uh, it, the the folks that I see making a ruckus about about that are folks that would probably just prefer they not be turned on in the first place. People that are just thinking about um, power conservation. Uh, people that might be you know thinking about power conservation and people that might just be sort of opposed to the whole cryptocurrency philosophy. You know, you of course know about all the rhetoric surrounding it, especially recently. No, that's great to hear then. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Let's finish up with uh, the last logical question, which we skipped away from uh, a little bit ago. And that's, where does this go from here? It's mid-December. We still don't have a lot of closure on what this new energy market's going to look like. It's now being booted over to lawmakers, which seemingly you know could take years. It's a bureaucracy. So how does this get done? What's your sense for where ERCOT goes from here? My sense of where we, we go from here as well, first of all, we're headed into uh, uh, the winter, which is now a stressful time for people. Um, uh, you know, thankfully, the the storm that happened uh, that caused, um, you know, so, so many people to die and, and the massive blackouts is, was very, you know, you know, I've I've lived I've never seen anything like that. And I've lived in Texas, you know, for more than 30 years. Um, so, uh, they did say they weatherized their equipment. You know, the question is what, you know, what happens when we're, we're tested? We don't, we don't know yet. Um, and as you, as you said, really the next step in the overall, what happens to the market is, uh, it, it gets kicked to the legislature, but I can tell you that unless if the legislature does nothing, the price of energy in Texas is going to go up. I couldn't tell you how that really, because I'm not an expert in other um, uh, in other power grids um, and other ISOs uh, across uh, across the you know the country. Um, but whatever we do to you know incentivize natural gas or do whatever to to make the grid more resilient costs money and the money in those those costs will always be passed down to the consumers whether it's me in austin texas or your mining operation out in you know out in west texas somewhere um the politically obviously the goal of everybody is to try to create a more resilient grid while minimizing costs as much as possible, but it's really hard to peg where those, um, where it's going to end up, uh, on, you know, already before inflation kind of took off, people were already seeing major increases to their, to their bills. I'm sure the folks that you've talked to have seen that as well, that this isn't as attractive as a state as it might've been. Um, uh, when the big boom of, of first started happening after the China thing. Um, so, uh, you know, who, so I, I wouldn't expect those prices to go down. Um, I'm, I'm wrong just as often as I'm right, but, um, all, all, 
all every single one of these market designs that that were recommend or not recommended but examined in uh, the report, every single one had added costs to it. Uh, the only one that didn't, the only thing that had no added cost to it was leave things as they are. And already, like just this past year with the new things that Urkan has done, the already costs have, have gone up. So, um, yeah, that's the long short of it. Yeah, I mean, it's unfair to look into the crystal ball, but it is helpful for people's expectations, maybe even just a little bit. Phil, I want to thank you so much for your time today on the Mining Pod. Thanks for your expertise and give us insight into what's happening down in Austin. Yeah, I had fun. Thanks so much.